Day from something I haven't um, read to anyone yet on, on the tour, um, and it was because I just talked to someone who'd read my book here in this room, and uh, she'd suggested that this was a nice one to uh, for the theme of unspeakable. <laughs> so here it goes. It says it's the last scene of a story called. The pastor's son. Oh, sorry, I've been speaking too low. Um, it's the last story from a scene called The, pa pa the Pastor's Son. Um, and the, I think the last scene is fairly discreet and stands on its own, but just a bit of context uh, before we get to it. It's a story of reverse immigration, a family that in a sense has failed in America and has returned to South Korea. We see a lot of that reverse immigration happening today, both in terms of people who have had good lives here and are going back for various personal reasons, and other people, whether it's South Korea or China or India, whose families are returning because they were never able to create a life for themselves out here. And this is one of those families. Um, the, father has a, the father has lost his wife fairly recently and has remarried. And we start the story uh, with that marriage to where it descends. And the son, the teenage son, is the narrator. Oh, and last thing, a very violent scene, or not very violent, but slightly violent scene has occurred. And uh, now the two, the father and uh, the mother has left. The son is left behind with his mother's picture. My mother's image was too broken up. There was nothing left of her now. She was gone. What was left in the house was the meager life that the years had given her, the smell of a man who had terrified her into becoming invisible. There were my sisters who had married men they knew they could dominate if needed, and me, unable to speak to people, because anything that felt true about me was a secret. Then I left the house. I ran until I caught sight of them and followed them from a ways back, calling to my father. But near the Han River walkway, I lost the two in the fog. I checked the parking lot, my hands feeling out before me. The rain swallowed the silence. The pleasure boat was docked, the paddle boats empty. One minute the rain thinned, then a sheet of rain fell so thick it erased my hands. It must have been ten yards ahead on the river sidewalk. I was straining to see when I spotted my father thrusting new mother into the river water. Closer, enormous bubbles, her ragged breathing rose up from the water. When he yanked her back up, new mother's breast sagged out of her unnada chogori. The skirt of her hanbok stuck to her heavy thighs. Her moan was like the sound of whales spuming. When he clawed off her hands, her body kneeled over as he released her into the water. I shouted, I'll get the police, I will. He thrust her in and out. There was no struggle now, no breath of resistance, nothing in that body except for her small, exhausted sounds. I scrambled down the embankment to the river's edge. I was nearly on top of them, but he didn't stop. Only then, I locked him by his arms and hauled him off her. He looked at me, his eyes black with anger. He said, go home, Tashik. There's no happiness here. New mother's flattened curls shrouded her face. She crouched on the cement, her breathing uneven. I said, stop it, please. God is everywhere. He looked crazed, sad. He gripped himself, trying to contain himself. But then he was on me. His breath was hard on my cheek as he locked me from behind by my arms. Decades, my junior, and you think you have rights? You think we're American? 
His teeth scraped against my ear. You're no pegging from America with white skin. You look like me. I laughed, convinced there was nothing of my father in me. On your knees, he said, and I want real sorrow in that apology. Say it. New mother said, he's your boy. She flinched with fear at her own words. You. He pointed through the fog to the ghostly cars. Go away, woman. Leave my family alone. His eyes bore into her. I told her, go. This isn't about you. Finally, she began walking backward, away from us, her eyes on him the entire time. I'm getting help. Don't worry. She kept screaming this until she was no longer there. He squatted, his shoulders like a sheet of wrestlers, his legs spidery. I'll break your legs if you don't get on them yourself. I said, is this the only way, Aboji, hurting people? Who are you, telling your father what he is and what he isn't? You bunnan keseki. His voice rammed into me. He swore he would teach me. His fist struck me in the stomach. His leg reared back. I heard a snap, like ice cracking in spring, as I fell. When the foot kicked out again, I balled up, my arms around my skull. And I waited for the blows from my father, the man I should love. I tried to imagine myself somewhere else, someone else. But I was only myself on the cold pavement. I was young, a stranger in my own country, again my father's easy victim. His foot sailed out again. I did the unforgivable. That foot, my father's own foot, I caught with one hand. Then I hit him. He lay on the pavement. His lips were parted as if he were thirsty. The rain beat down on his face, his nose bled, and his forehead swelled a dull purple. He closed his mouth, opened it. He was trying to say something. Chingyu, I don't know why, this anger. He looked up. Chingyu, don't cry, please. He kissed my head, my chest. His hands were wet, rubbery, as he caressed my hand. I saw he didn't want to leave me like all the others had. You know what I think about every day, I said. I asked myself why God took the wrong parent. My father dragged himself up, his hair shiny against his forehead. I listened, unmoved by his weary breath. You know the old saying, he said, if your parents die, you bury them in the mountains. If your child dies, you bury him in your heart. He reached for me the way he always did when he was calmer. Adura, no one will ever love you the way I do. What do you want from me? The rain came. My father sighed, the sound threadbare, labored. Chingyu, I didn't have a father, he said. I don't know how to be a father. I stood still. He paced, then turned back. His brogues made prints in the rain before they were washed away. This rage, his voice slowed. I can't slow myself. Enough, Awaji. I walked away. When I held my hands out in front of me, they were shaking. They were strangers to me, these large knuckles and thick fingers I would grow into. I turned. Adura. I said nothing. My father took off his shoes and laid them neatly on the cement as if he had just come home. He sat, legs folded over each other, then got up again, as if he wasn't sure where he wanted to be. He walked over. His hands held my face, and he stared deep into my eyes. He kissed my cheeks. Adura, pray for me. His voice dropped. No matter what, tell them I drowned. And just as I moved toward him, my father turned his back on me and on God and stepped casually off the riverside path and into the river. 
I have not looked at photos of my father for years. His bloated river face and emptied out eyes have faded for me, though I still hear his cadences, those broken incantations that rang through my childhood. Soon after my father's passing, I stopped attending church. No matter how often new mother reminded me that I was a pastor's son, I could never go back. During my college years, I dutifully visited new mother. Sometimes I just made phone calls. Every year, I poured the rice wine that my father liked so much over his grave and pulled the weeds around the tombstone. I ordered flowers for my mother's grave, stranded in America. Just after I graduated, I fell in love with and married a woman who nurtured the faith that I no longer could. Through her, even after we returned to America, a part of me stayed connected to Korea and to the church. I believed myself to be happy, or at least reconciled, as we settled in New Jersey, acquired our first mortgage, and took week-long holidays in the summers and winters. Time passed for me, time stayed still. Seoul is a city that, no matter its changes as it modernized, I will always remember as my father's. On my last day there, I walked through Wu Meat Market, where merchants unloaded pigs' heads leaking blood from the mouths and necks, and passed men staggering into the dark, men seeking brawls and seeking love. I saw the violence that my father had grown up with and passed down to us. I felt what my father must have always carried with him, the terrible war, its long ago shadow that cast far beyond and drew you in like a thirsty curse. Only then I understood what the war had done to us. When the monsoon rains descended that July, I thought of how he had wanted to walk with God, but had been incapable of it. I see now that his slightly bow-legged walk is my walk, that my black, watchful eyes are his. When I see a stranger hunched over, devouring a cut of filet mignon as if it were a bowl of ramyun, I see my father and the hunger he had grown up with. There he is for me, an orphan hungry all his life. Thank you. The novel I 